Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Ralf and in today's interview I'm talking to Harald Großkopf. With his unique drum playing style, Harald profoundly influenced the German electronic music scene. His life and musical background is full of interesting anecdotes and outstanding achievements. He is really opening up in this interview and thereby revealing a lot of information that is of interest to every fan of electronic music. Moreover, he is sharing some insights on how he collaborated with Klaus Schulze on some legendary electronic music albums. This is an interview you don't want to miss. So without further ado, we start today's episode. Hello ladies and gentlemen. In today's interview I'm being joined by Harald Großkopf. Harald is a drummer from Germany who was a driving force behind the development of the electronic music scene in Germany during the 1970s. In the late 1960s he was the drummer for the legendary German heavy metal band The Scorpions. From 1971 until 1975 he was the drummer for the German band Wallenstein. Then he joined Manuel Göttingen's band Ashra. Harald was also playing the drums on several Klaus Schulze's studio albums. In 1980 he recorded his legendary album Synthesis using a Prophet 10 synthesizer among other things. And in 1981 he founded the Neue Deutsche Welle band Lily Berlin. Well, there's so much ground to cover and I'm really glad to welcome Harald Großkopf. Hello Harald, how is it Hi. going? Hi there, I'm, I'm fine. Well, the, to, you know, the, to, I started in 1965 playing drums because I thought I could impress girls easier than having uh, sitting behind another instrument or playing guitar. I thought drums is more, more simple. And uh, it took a while to find out that uh, there's more than just impressing girls to music. You know? <laughs> and well, you know, the Scorpion thing was, uh, I went to ki in kindergarten when I was uh, four and five years old with Rudolf Schenker, the, the, found, the founding member and the, 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 the first member and the one who, who, who did the Scorpions all, all his life. And we went to, together in kindergarten and two years in the same school. At and kindergarten. Yeah, and, and he, when, when we were 15, 16, he founded the Scorpions, and my beat band was called the Stuntman. And sometimes when their drummer, Wolfgang, uh, was, was ill, you know, I, uh, I joined in. But I, I never really was a member of the Scorpions, so, but um, I think it's a nice legend. You know? <laughs> well, so Harald, then I want to kick off the interview you with a question is there any success quote or some, ki some kind of saying, mantra or maxim that you live by and that has helped you on your journey as a musician and artist? Well, when you are young, you, you're longing for acceptance and, and re being respected. And, uh, and uh, my, my goal was very high. I wanted to become a famous pop musician, but uh, that can be very frustrating, you know. And uh, during my experience making music, I found out it's uh, the, the, the biggest success you can have when you are able to, to, to make music, you know, and to pr produce music. This is the biggest success. Anything else is, uh, can be very frustrating, whether you have no money or whether you have a lot of money. Okay. Then, Harald, please go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. You told us something already, how you got started with drums, but then how did you get into electronic music and synthesizers? And perhaps you can also touch on the production of the album Synthesis. Yeah, well, I, I, I love drumming and uh, for me drumming was the thing. I never thought sitting behind a keyboard and I remember it was at the Dirk Studios in uh, one of the first uh, uh, recordings for Wallenstein, uh, there, were, there was a mini MOOC, you know, and uh, this machine was very, I don't know, was very mystic for me. 
and uh, there were a lot of knobs and I turned the knobs and I, there, I couldn't get any sound out and, and I, later, much later I found out that, you know, synthesizer, they have a, a, an envelope generator, uh, attack, decay, sustain, release and because from my experience knobs had to turn from left to right so I turned the attack off and I was wondering that nothing came out, which was the first very frustrating experience with electronic music, you know. And then uh, we, during those uh, sessions, you know, uh, the, the record company, uh, uh, they, they, uh, they, they started sessions with musicians from Berlin, like Tangerine Dream and Klaus Schulze and, uh, and Manuel Goetschek. And I really, uh, from the first moment, I liked this kind of music. And, uh, you know, this that was the first time when I heard a sequencer. And I was so fascinated by a sequencer because it was had such an, an incredible groove my rock band, Wallenstein, never had. And so uh, I was, uh, during those sessions, I really fell in love with uh, this kind of music and uh, started to... Get in, uh, get in contact with uh, with with these people, and uh, the first uh, the the first guy who reacted was Klaus Schulze, and he invited me to his home. Uh, in those time, he was already moved to uh, to uh, near Hanover, and um, I visited him. And he, after a few hours, he after a few hours talking, you know, he uh, said, oh, "Come on, let's go in my in my studio." And then it was just a simple room in his basement, and. Uh, he started the sequencer, and from the first moment, I was thrilled, and I was looking for a drums, and there wasn't no drums around, so I took a a basket, you know, and I turned <laughs> it upside down and started drumming on that spontaneously. And Schulze really loved it, and he said, "Let's do our next record together," you know, and uh, uh, that's so that's how uh, uh, Moon Dawn happened, and uh, that was another very strange experience for me because I was used. To, uh, to, to, to rehearse a lot, you know, we rehearsed with Wallenstein, it was classic music and classic rock elements and uh, it was very complicated to, to keep that in mind because I couldn't read notes and I, I, I still don't um, and I was used to, to work in team with a band but Schulz was completely different. He came into the studio and it took such a long time to build up all that equipment. It was, it was an, a ritual and, you know, a, a, a huge, uh, his huge MOOC setup uh, contained, I think, six or eight uh, oscillators, you know. And they had the fucking same problem I had was, was that MOOC, you know. I, I, I later will talk about, you know, they, 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 they go easy out of tune. You know, somebody's opened the door and the temperature's going down. And you've had it, you know. And so it took a long time to get that machine in harmony. But once it was in harmony, it was an incredible experience. And so uh, we said, he said, now we're ready. Let's, let's do a session. And uh, we improvised for, I don't know, five, six minutes. And then stopped playing, uh, met in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the director room and... Uh, and uh, then we we had the feeling the same feeling oh that was that wasn't it you know we have to do it again, and then we played and it was one thing one improvisation for I don't know twenty five minutes and there were no emotional mistakes I would say you know like a bad feeling or something it was completely floating and uh, it was uh, and, and uh, that was uh, exactly the, uh, the, uh, the 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 that was the title of the of the, of the of that piece of music, and it was r incredible releasing for me, you know, like uh, a release, a, a emotional release after frustrating times with a rock band, ups, ups and down, and bad feelings in team and stuff like that. And so uh, I, w I was hooked to, to this kind of music. From this moment was, a, was the, uh, the, the, the very big step. Okay, I just want to tell to the viewers Moon Dawn, the record, was recorded in 1976 at Studio Pannepausen in Frankfurt. Yeah. Yeah. And the first side of this album is called Floating Music. Yeah. And then I think the second record you played on was Klaus Schulz's Body Love 1 and Body Love 2. And then uh, the double, double album X, mm -hmm. which... Um, 
play. There's also an orchestra on that record, mm -hmm. the, X, the double album, just to tell the viewers a little bit what year we are talking of. Wow. Um, yeah, I think it was, uh, Body Love must have been a year later, like 77, you know, and uh, it, was, it was a music for a pornography film. <laughs> and uh, I remember that we went to Düsseldorf to see uh, the, the producer, you know, and, uh, and, and Schuster said, oh, they, they pay a very good money and uh, we will do that, you know. So, and then we, uh, the, he arranged it and then we went to Frankfurt and he, he was so well paid that from the money he received from that uh, porno production, he was able to produce Body Love and uh, uh, the album, the, 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 the X, the Tense album, you know. Okay. And uh, paying the orchestra which was the orchestra of the Hessian uh, uh, radio station. And uh, that was an incredible experience. Yeah. And, and during the pornography uh, of, of, of film, we had, to, we had to watch the pornography, you know, this film over and over again. It was so, it was so you know, you don't believe it, it was so boring yeah. after a while. <laughs> after, after, and after, after two or two days, you just were counting the pimples on the skin of the actors, you know. <laughs> Okay. Um, Harold, the first Klaus Schulz album I bought was the Life album, which was released during summer 1980. And I think also on these Life albums you played the drums. So I think you went on tour together with Klaus Schulz, playing drums live, right? Or am I mistaken? No, you, no, 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 no. Also, I think I think Cyborg was a was a. I don't know which one it was. It was. I think it was before. Black Dance, the album. His first album was called Irlich, Twilight. Yeah, yeah. the first. You know, solo and album. I must, I didn't like that album. You know, this was when I when I met Klaus and I heard this album, I said, "Wow, what's very strange music?" I just couldn't get into that. And my first, uh, uh, my first impression uh, after I started, uh, oh, the, the album that made me like. Klaus music was black dance, which I heard in the radio, you know, a couple of, it was in 73 or 72, I can't remember. And that, because it had, had melodies, it had rhythm, but Irlich was very, from, from my point of view, very abstract and it was not, didn't touch my mood so, so well, you know. Okay, but did you play live with him? Yeah, we played, a, a legendary concert was the Meta Music Festival uh, in... Oh, 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 when was that? 77, 76, I can't remember exactly. And there was uh, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Reich playing, and that was, and, and Klaus and, and I, we had the chance to, to, to listen to their rehearsals during the night, you know, and we were about the only people sitting in the, in the public and listened to Steve Reich and his uh, incredible music. <laughs> Which was an inspiration, you know. I mean, the, the minimal musics of Steve Reich and uh, Terry Riley and so on, that was a great inspiration because it had this repetition and the simplicity of sequencing. So, uh, but Steve, everything was completely uh, a natural instrument. I mean, natural like this because. Uh, acoustic. Acoustic it's instrument natural. because. Uh, one sentence of Klaus, I really like, he said, you know, when people said, ah, oh, so you play such uh, unnatural instruments and artificial stuff, you know, everybody can do it. He said, pianos don't grow on trees or like uh, string instruments don't grow on the ground or whatever, you know. So I, I really like that. <laughs> the, well, Steve Reich was very, very impressive. Okay. okay. Then I would like to move on to um, to synthesis. Mm -hmm. You know, your first electronic music album where you played the drums and also the synthesizers. And this was recorded, I think, late 1979. Mm -hmm. And there is one track on it, the first track. It's called So Weit, So Gut. And the way it kicks off, it's... Bam! It's great, really. I heard it for the first time in 1981, and it was mind-blowing, really. Great stuff. So, Harald, please go ahead and tell us a little bit about the background of this production and how this 
record was developed. Yeah, you don't believe it, but I was very insecure, you know, and uh, I felt I was a drummer, and as a drummer, I was secure, but I was very insecure, you know, playing keyboards because I hadn't hadn't learned that, and I couldn't read notes, and. Uh, Uh, I didn't have the idea to make a solo album until somebody, a friend of mine, his name was Udo Hunten, and uh, he was an electronic musician, and he came to Berlin, uh, phoned with me, and then we met, and he played me his music, which I really liked, and then he inspired me. He said, why don't you make a solo record? And I said, as a drummer, you know, one solo, drum solo after another, I don't know, that doesn't make sense. So, and he said, no, no, you, I mean, you played with Klaus Schulze, and... Uh, And with Ashra, why don't you make a solo album with electronic instrument? I said, I don't have any idea how these machines work, you know. And he said, okay, I know you have an A-track recorder and I have equipment at home. You know, I can borrow you uh, my equipment, my, my, my mini MOOC and, and, and my uh, recording desk. And later on for my records... Uh, you borrow me your A-track record. I said, okay, let's do that. And then I went to his pl his place in West Germany and f f uh, and uh, was expecting that he helped me, you know, all the time, you know, sitting aside and running the desk and stuff. And I just have had to press knobs. But uh, he said, okay, here's all the settings, you know, blah, blah, blah. Bye-bye. You know, I'm, I stay with my girlfriend. And then so he left me alone with that machine. And it was incredible... I mean, I was shocked almost, you know, to be sometime to, to be suddenly confronted just by myself with uh, with, with these instruments. And uh, but I, in in the in, in uh, after a week, I could handle it. You know, I, I know how it worked. You know, and uh, and I, I found out how it worked and uh, started recording uh, and very emotional stuff. You know, I just let out what I had in mind. I didn't have the idea to to copy. Uh, Uh, you know, like Tangerine Dream or Klaus Schulze. I just made what came out of me. It was very personal. And uh, it took six weeks, you know, sometimes uh, night sessions, uh, uh, tons of coffee. And, and, and of course, we, I blew, blew ill illegal stuff too. Uh, and uh, that helped to, to, to get along with these frustrations, you know. It was as frustrating as it was uh, uh, a lot of fun and uh, releasing of, of my emotions was equalized, you know, it was kind of the, the kind of same uh, uh, feelings, bad feelings and good feelings too. And, uh, okay. and one problem was, you know, the out of tune thing. I just was talking about when we recorded with Klaus, Moondawn. <clears throat> and uh, I had the same problem there, you know, this bitch went out of tune after 10 minutes and we, we, the, you, I just had eight tracks and uh, I wanted to use parallel sequences and I just had one sequence and this mini MOOC and a polyphonic uh, cork synthesizer and uh, so I, I, I had to... Uh, to record one track after another, which was, uh, wasn't possible in those times, because uh, there was no MIDI existing. MIDI now, these days, is the, the link uh, to, 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 uh, to, to adapt one, uh, one synthesizer machine with the other. And in those times, it wasn't existing. And in the house where I recorded it, there was a guy who was building c uh, synthesizers, and, uh, and he... He was an electronic freak, and he built a cable uh, and switched it to an oscillator, you know, to a standalone oscillator. And then he uh, he he kind of managed uh, the cable with uh, with electronic stuff, so that uh, I could record like I formatted like one track, and uh, this signal I could use to uh, to 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 run sequences parallel. And with the out of tune thing, it was. Uh, You found out after 10 minutes recording a second or third sequence, you know, which was very frustrating because it took so long sometimes and I had to repeat it and I repeat it again until I could, uh, I was able to, to say, okay, now it's, now it's in harmony, you know. Okay. And what's about the Prophet 10? Yeah. Have you used the Prophet 10 on this record? Yeah, well, I had a manager who... Uh, uh, who was uh, well, he was managing me, and he he bought this machine, which was very very 
expensive in those times. I think it was I don't know, 20,000 Deutschmarks, which was uh, <coughs> unbelievable, a lot, lot of money. He was a, a cameraman and he made money filming t on TV and films. And uh, so he, he said, here, I, I, I buy you this machine and start working. But I just had this machine and, and no other equipment. So I couldn't just, I couldn't handle it because I was used when I was 21 going in studios, everything was there, all instruments there. And then we started playing and was just one machine. And, and I didn't even have a, a desk. So, and no, uh, there was no echoes and no reverb, no compressors. And so I, I really couldn't uh, uh, work the way I, I wanted with the machines. And he took it away after uh, I found it you know, this NDV, Neue Deutsche Welle, band Lily Berlin, and we used uh, uh, the Prophet 10 without his permission. He said, no, you, it's just for you, and you don't use it anywhere else. And, and he saw this little video clip on TV and saw that we, our keyboarder, you know, I played drums and the keyboarder used the Prophet 10, and then he took it away from us, you know, from me. <laughs> Great machine. I'd, I'd love to have it these days, you know. Um, listen, some time ago I made a video blog about Cream Music in Frankfurt. It's a very, very legendary and historic music store. And when I shot that video blog, Robert Hahn, the guy who is running that mm. store, he showed me an old Prophet 10. Wow, yeah. Maybe they still have it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he is trying to sell it. So maybe he will make you a special prize because you're the Harald Großkopf. You know, recording almost an entire album with a Prophet 10. Well, really, almost, this record yeah. sounds so good. I encourage people out there, Google it on YouTube and listen to Synthesis. It's great. Well, awesome I, stuff. I never really was a, you know, a, an analog fanatic, you know. Uh, um, and I, I had very few synthesizers in my life. Uh, I just bought a, a MOOC uh, Sub 39 or 37, I don't know. Uh, because, you know, Francis Ford Coppola, the famous film director, he once said, uh, it's not the machine, it's always the man, uh, the artist, you know, it's the, the man behind. It's never the machine. And I think this, this, is, this is true. A lot of people make with very simple equipment uh, incredible creative things. And uh, this was also, it was always my intention to 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 do uh, to produce with what I have you know I don't long for anything uh, and I don't say okay I can't work because I don't have that and that and uh, it's 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 you know you need that state of mind to, to be able to work free you know otherwise you you always have a, a wish which is not uh, fulfillable or I mean a lot of people they buy so much equipment you know, and spend so much money, and the music uh, sounds like Tangerine Dream or like Klaus Schulze, but who wants to have uh, a second Klaus Schulze or a second Tangerine Dream band, you know what I mean? I prefer any in any art uh, that people are keeping their, their own expressions, their very personal, emotional life and their own... Uh, even their own sounds, you know. Okay. And it does. But you see. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a synthesizer or it's a, a, a piano or whatever. It really doesn't matter. It's the feeling behind uh, the person. It, it hasn't to do with the instrument. Well, that's how it's supposed to be. But the people who copy other artists, who buy equipment and copy other artists, they are still creating something. I have seen people who just buy gear and are not doing any music at all. That's what I mean. They, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the people who, who copy somebody else, it's th at least they are still doing something. But um, Harold, now I would like to move on to some more philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. We covered a lot of gear and music. Now I would like to ask you, what are your core values as a musician and artist? And has there been a major incident in your life that made you really aware of these core values and which then subsequently helped you on your artistic journey? 
I, I, I always felt an energy in myself that was stronger than my personality, you know. It's, it's very hard to explain because uh, I was a very insecure young man and uh, but with all the frustrations, I, I had to do it, you know. With all the, the limitations and with all the, the blockages, you know, I, I, I had to do it for some reason and uh, I think this was the, the, this is a very strong intention which, I don't know, which is not my... It's not my 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 urn, you know. It's it's just in me, and I I can't I can't help it. I have to do it. I have to do music, because it's coming out of me, and uh, that's maybe that's the magic of of music, you know. That uh, you have such an intention, and that feeling has always been there. It, it sometimes you lose it, you know. I I had I had times where for three or four years, uh, thought, oh, I'm so empty, you know. What can I do? And uh, but in these days, I see my time run, uh, running out. I'm, I'm 66, and uh, you know, time is limited. I'm fairly healthy, but uh, uh, time is limited. You know, when I look back the last 20 years, and uh, if I look back the next 20 years, if I have 20 years, you know, uh, you know, this kind of uh, inspires me too. Sometimes it pushes me. You know, I have so many ideas still. And so so much things to organize and to do, and uh, I'm uh, I have the same um, excitement making music, uh, uh, which I had when I was fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. You know. Hey, really cool. I really appreciate your honesty there. You know that you also show your vulnerability. So once you grow older, you get the feeling running out of time and you push yourself a bit harder. Then, um, Harald, what is your biggest oh. regret or mistake as a musician? And what have you learned from it? Oh, God, yeah. To, to, to say yes when your feelings say, uh, says no, you know. Uh, you know, when you when you are sometimes in, in a studio with musicians, you don't have a an, a warm feeling with you know, and uh, uh, and you still do it. You know, this is I, I would regret that. I I, I will not name. I will not uh, uh, put out names, but um, I had sometimes f feeling like that. You know, uh, so you shouldn't do that. You know, you should make music if you do music with others. You know. You should really like them. I mean, they could they could have a, I mean, a lot of good, good musicians or artists. They have always strange uh, habits, you know. But I really like that. If it's if it's not too strange, you know. Okay, so um, you follow your intuition, and if your intuition yeah. is telling you yes, you go for it, and if your intuition is telling you no. You better say no. But sometimes in the past you made the mistake you, that you said yes anyway, even though you didn't like it. Yeah, because I needed money, you know, and uh, yeah, and and uh, I was, uh, you know, I was very close to in the in the eighties after I made my my first record because I was, as I said, I was an insecure person, and I was even with uh, with after I finished uh, synthesis. I was very insecure with this recordings, you know, because with this manager I was talking about, we went to, to Edgar Fröse's home and played him my record, you know, played him synthesis before it was on the market. And he listened to it uh, carefully, but uh, he didn't um, give any comments on it, you know. He was was stone no faced and so on. And, and I said, oh God, what have I done, you know? <laughs> so, um, and it, it took... And... My expectation in making a record in those times, you know, was, I don't know, 100,000 and uh, 60,000, 30,000. And then I just sold uh, Sky Records, you know, the vinyl issue was like around 10,000. Today, everybody would kiss my feet. But in those days, I said, oh, God, just 10,000. It's a... And I it's bought a, one, Harald. Yeah, yeah. I bought one in <laughs> 1981. <laughs> Well, <laughs> the renewal version as a young teenager, you know, loving it. And I and I didn't listen it to years. I don't know how many years I I, I didn't touch this record, you know. And uh, so I, the more I was surprised, uh, 
when when I got started with the internet and having connection to the world, you know, uh, and this incredible uh, internet machinery which connects you uh, in a very, very great uh, way to, to the world. Like we, we, we speak now, I mean, this was impossible uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and now we record stuff and I'm sitting uh, at my table and uh, I love that. And uh, since then I get... Uh, uh, a lot of respect and a lot of reactions from even from young people uh, to my recordings, to, to synthesis especially. And uh, I, 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 it's the third time that I reissued it. And the, the, in, in, in 2011, I did that on a small record company in New York, and uh, I got invited to play on a small festival and I played there t two gigs in New York and. The reaction of the young people, there was nobody elder than 25, you know, and they knew my record and they said, oh, great. And it was such a, such a warm, great feeling. And it, 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 it's, it's, still, it's still there. And, I, and since then, I, I play more and more live. And, uh, and I was in, in, in England last year and I was in Paris, I was in Poland. And the same reaction, young people like that stuff. And I hope it, it will continue or it will even grow, you know. I have two gigs in, in England in, in this year already. And, uh, well, that's, that's nice, you know. And one and a half year ago, that was the first time that I was on a stage behind a keyboard and my, uh, my, my, my software machinery alone on stage, you know. Before that, I had always, you know... Uh, uh, for a very long time, I must f say first, uh, I wasn't. I, I was. I, I thought it wasn't. Able, I wasn't. It wasn't possible to 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 uh, to play to perform synthesis on the other records. I, I just didn't know how to do that, you know. And, but with the development of modern software like Ableton Live, if people know that. You know, I can. I can. Uh, I had to recreate it because all the tapes were lost. And, uh, and, and I can play loops and I can make the changes w whenever I like and I can play live solos on, on, on that. And uh, that was a, another great feeling for me to do it alone, you know, for a while. And uh, yeah, and now I have, I'm back to jo joining uh, other to, to, to my projects. And uh, the latest project is uh, there will be somebody who is kind of, DJing, live remixing my music, which I created in my in my software during the last ten years, you know, and I will play drums again, and uh, we will have screenings uh, like 3D mapping, which is uh, a, a video projection on uh, on real surfaces, whatever size or whatever form they have, but we were just using two screens. Uh, the 16 to 9 format, like two uh, smartphones uh, left and right of the stage, pretty huge size, and uh, somebody will uh, play music, uh, play video loops to the music, you know, parallel and in timing, which will be a great experience too. Hey, cool. Yeah. Then, um, Harold, how do you deal with self-doubt and self-criticism that befalls so many musicians and artists? Well, I, in my, in my youngest day, you know, I was, uh, I don't know, hiding myself um, using drugs, you know, I was, I was never really into alcohol, but in, in, I, had to, I had a time where I used all kinds of drugs to, to compensate, which doesn't work, you know, and that was a very intense time, especially in, in, in the 70s, you know, everybody, or most of the people did that, and, uh, and it was a, a, a social... A social thing too to 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 join in, but uh, you get very lazy, you know. And uh, this is one thing I regret. I should have been more um, active in in, my, in the seventies and in the eighties, you know. <laughs> okay. So, and if you have today, if you have any self doubt, and if you are too critical towards your own music, mm -hmm. how do you deal with it? Well, the thing is. <clears throat> Once I, rec I only record 
pieces, you know, I record loop by loop and I play, I improvise and play and play. And uh, I, I only accept it when I, and when, when I like it, you know. And uh, so all these little pieces combined to a piece of music uh, is a combination of little pieces that I like. And once I like it, it will never go, you know. So when I listen to, when I have self doubt I just listen to this, this music and this feeling is coming back to me, you know. And uh, there, there's, there are always people that say, oh, bullshit, and I don't like that kind of music. This, you can't change that, you know. It's a, it's, uh, you have to deal, deal it with yourself always, you know. You have to... You have to find a way to, to get in balance with that. There's always, uh, I, have, I've, I have still have doubts here and there, but uh, my, in my experience, uh, once I like something I have done, it, it, it can't be taken away from me. Okay, Harold, and what's the boldest thing you have ever done? Wow. Can even be outside of music. No, in general, what's the boldest thing you have ever done in your life so far? Yeah, that was 20 years ago. And we went to, to the Canary Islands. And I was a good, good swimmer because I was a, in my, in my youth, I was, a, I was doing races and stuff. And, and, and I was a very good swimmer. And uh, 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, I can't remember, we went to the Canary Islands and there was this one day huge waves and I've seen just a few people going, jumping into these waves. There were rocks and all, everybody was watching. And the next day, the same waves, and I said, I can do that, what they had done yesterday. You know? and, I, and I jumped into these waves and there were all kinds of really rocks. You couldn't even stand there. You had to, to jump into, into the to the off-floating waves, you know, to, to be carried into the sea, you know. And I did that very, in very shallow water, you know, you rush uh, upon those uh, round rocks, you know. And suddenly I was like 20, 30 meters uh, away from the beach and turning my face to my people, hello, you know, <laughs> how great I am, you know. And then suddenly <laughs> there was this... This, this draw from behind. And then I turned myself and there came, I don't know, eerie, I mean, from, from the water surface, at least, I don't know, five meter waves, you know, pulling me towards them, to, towards, the, towards the sea. And I started praying, you know, and, it, and then they, they took me and they came over me and then I was like three, four meters uh, uh, beyond the surface. And then I came back, and then another wave, and another, like five or six. And I know that the ocean always have periods, you know. And, and then when I, when I, so I had, I had to go back and not to get into in panic, you know. And I, I finally managed to get out of the sea, and I, my knees was blood, and my heart was pumping. And even when I start, when I'm thinking about it and talking about it, my heart starts beating. And I never do such uh, silly things again, you know. That was uh, that was bold. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bold, and I think you must have learned a lesson from it. You know, yes, yes. life can end any moment. Y yes, so yes, appreciate yes. life, huh? Yeah. I don't have oh. much fears. You know, maybe uh, I was I was much I had much more fears in when I was young. You know, uh, than I have now because you know I was grown up in a in a, in a in the 60s and in the 50s, 60s, and uh, we were grown up with all these Nazi uh, environment, with all this Nazi atmosphere. You know, my, most of my teachers, they were soldiers or party members. My father was a party member, and uh, there was this dark atmosphere around, you know, this strong, uh, uh, very less joyful atmosphere. And uh, I had, it was a fight of my life to, with my father, you know. When I was like 14, we went to, to a concentration camp in, in, in near Hanover, Bergen-Belsen. And the school class, you know, on the parking place, ah, blah, blah, you know, very funny. And then we entered uh, uh, Bergen-Belsen, uh, the, the ground, and we, I was shocked, you know, these, these numbers, 20,000, 15,000, they were like trapezoid kind of uh, mass graves and the pictures and so and suddenly everybody was 
calm. And everybody was shocked, you know, and uh, that kind of woke me up, you know, to, to start think political. And from that moment, I, I, I had problems with my father because he was a Nazi party member until the end. And um, it, was, it was a very hard fight with him all the time. You know, after five minutes, the Nazi theme was on the table. And, uh, well, it took 10 years before he died, I, I, I stopped this discussion because, uh, you know, he was, he was brain. this generation was brainwashed. And I think uh, making music was thought of an expression of the rebellion against this atmosphere. We want to do it differently, you know. We, that's why we threw away all tradition, you know, which is a shame, you know, which is uh, too much over the edge, you know, because tradition is, uh, of course, a, a positive thing, but we threw anything because we connected everything to, to, to the Nazi times. And uh, so we rebelled and we, we, we want to... I didn't want to, to, to use Anglo-American influences from outside. I, was, that was, I didn't like that. I couldn't hear rock music uh, from, I don't know, 1974. I, I started hating rock music. And uh, because it was all the same until today, same riffs, same chords, and same attitudes. You see 70-year-old men acting like 18-year-old 18 18 teenagers, which is uh, it's a joke, it's a joke so I, I think, you know. And uh, so making electronic music, it was, from, from my point of view, it was a, a rebellion too, you know, going into space, you know, widen the, 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 uh, the, 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 dense, the density of, of the situation, you know, to using reverb and echo and, and dancing and monotony as an uh, instrument, monotony as an instrument of... Uh, how do you say that? Um, magic, you know. Trance, okay. getting away from bad feelings. Yeah, just escaping reality mm -hmm. for a mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. and then listen to some. Yeah. When I discovered electronic music, it was actually also a music teacher. We went through all pop music styles and this man was really very educated and very open-minded. And then he also uh, said cosmic rock, Krautrock, is from Germany. And he mentioned Tangerine Dream. Mm -hmm. and, then also, and then I started buying Tangerine Dream records. And from there, things evolved. I started buying more and more. And when I heard the first record of Klaus Schulze, Time Wind, I was blown away, really. And this was, was a very young boy. I was mm -hmm. listening to yeah, in 1980, 81, and when I heard this kind of music for the first time, I was really blown away. This was mesmerizing, really. Mm -hmm. But let's move back to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What three tips would you give to aspiring electronic musicians today? Uh, not taking it too serious, you know, <laughs> with all the knobs, you know. It's, it's just a, it's a machine, and it uh, should create joy. You know, and uh, it's it's not the, as I said, it's not the instrument; it's the man behind. You know, you gotta be free. You gotta uh, liberate yourself. You know, from from uh, from limits. You know, even from loving uh, or getting if getting in love with some music. You know, because as soon as you get got in love with music, you know, you start copying it inside. You know, unconsciously. So when somebody said, when you meet the Buddha, kill him, you know, this is, this is an, an intention, this is a tip what I mean, you know, uh, uh, not copying things, you know, try to, to be open and being critical in seeing if you copy things, you know, because uh, every human being is a, an individual and uh, Art is always an expression of this individual, and it contains doubts, negativity, uh, melancholia, joy, whatever, you know. So uh, it's not just, you know, dance music and uh, life is so beautiful from, uh, from 10 to, to 10. Uh, that's Schlager, and uh, you can see when you, when you see successful people who do 
commercial music, how how much problems they have sometimes in their personal life, you know, because they don't express that on, on stage. I rather like uh, depressive music, you know, to 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 to, to 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 I don't know to see myself in that because depression is part of life. So everybody is, has depressive uh, uh, elements in his life, you know, and that should be should be expressed in music. Part of the art yeah. one creates. Yes. Okay, then I would like to ask you three questions. Mm -hmm. And please answer them as quickly as possible. Just a short, concise answer. I'm trying. Uh, so what or whom do you think of when you hear the word success? Well, success. I, I you know, uh, Rodelius, you know, Achim Rodelius. Rodelius. Yeah. Okay, uh, fair enough. Well, Pink Floyd until 1976 or 75, you know. Um, um, Steve Reich, good music, never really popular, but good music. Um, we're talking about music or any other art too. For the word success, could have been yeah, anything. Yeah, could, What came to your mind, you know, the first thing that came to your mind was Joachim Rodelius. Yeah, so I yeah, think, yeah. okay. But now, about the music, the next question. Is there any music album or maybe a movie or a book that you recommend on a regular basis and might even give away as a present? Oh. So music you mentioned already Pink Floyd. So yeah, maybe yeah. there's a particular But album. Like the, the Piper's Gate, Piper's at the Gates of Dawn, I, I liked in those times, or A Source of Secrets, or Tangerine Dreams, Fedra, Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, the Rolling Stones singer, 2000 Light Years from Home. Um, the Cream, the, their album Disraeli Gears, or uh, Jimi Hendrix album, the first uh, Jimi Hendrix album, and uh, or by Vivaldi, uh, the Vier Jahreszeiten, or the French, uh, the movie French Connection, uh, Matrix film. <laughs> <laughs> so there are so many things you recommend. Okay. <laughs> All right, then, Harald. Um, Imagine you could travel back in time, back to the future style. Mm. Yeah? And you had the chance to meet the 20-year-old Harald Groskopf. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give him? I would say fuck your doubts and uh, over <laughs> overcome your inertia, you know. Okay, I, perfect. Because <laughs> I, I was a la lazy dude for a while. <laughs> okay, and then uh, Harald... Is there any website or an online tool that you are using nowadays for your music production or maybe for your work in general? Well, I'm, I'm connected pretty well, you know, Facebook. Uh, Facebook? Even young, two young guys told me uh, two years ago, you know, that's for old, old people, you know. <laughs> Facebook is for old people. And, uh, well, SoundCloud, Twitter, Instagram, Vine, I like, you know, you know Vine? Yeah, you know, I know. This, this loop thing because uh, yeah. uh, lots of it is incredible trashy and, and not good but some stuff is very creative and I like the idea to to bring things on the on on the, on the point you know in a very short time you know uh, that's What? that's because that's very um, how do you say, intuitive you know to do it now you know and in a very short time like a sketch bam 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 Just get it out there, fix it yeah, on yeah. something. Good. Get it on paper. Yeah, there was Metaphorically speaking, get it out yeah, on paper, yeah. then you have something I was, you can fall back on. There was this yeah. one experience in, in, at school. I don't know how old I was, maybe 11 or 12. And we had to, to, to paint, you know, with uh, watercolors. We had to paint outside the, the church we saw from our classroom windows, you know. And I said, oh, God, what the fuck, you know, I... I Just, and, I, and I took a pencil and I drawed it very fast, I don't know, in five minutes, you know. And I said, oh, fuck it, you know, I, I, I don't care. And then the teacher took it and said, wow, this is art, you know. And so this was my first experience with spontaneous, fast reacting, doing something, you know. 
cool. So, and Harold, what projects are you currently working on? Well, I, I already uh, uh, mentioned it, you know, like 3D mapping, you know, which is, uh, people who don't know about it, um, you can Google it, you know, it's, uh, you can, there's software, you know, and then you can connect as many uh, projectors as you like, and then you can uh, project on objects films, whether are they are 3D films or just colors or whatever, you know, very impressive. And uh, I give you a, a link which will really impress, uh, impress you what in, 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 the, in the case of uh, 3D mapping, that is 3D mapping on moving objects, you know, like two computer arms move two-dimensional screens and, it, and, and combine them and it looks like like a three-dimensional object on stage. Incredible, you know, this is state-of-the-art, state-of-3D mapping art. And uh, my next gig will be filmed with virtual reality camera. You know, somebody from England I met, I have uh, a management in England and one of the guys who's very much into virtual reality and psychedelic stuff and uh, he, he managed uh, to, that somebody's coming over from a, f from a company and he's going to film it with uh, two camera sets on my next gig and uh, it will be presented on YouTube, uh, I hope, yeah. <laughs> hey, cool. Yeah. So then where can people find you on the internet? I suppose you have a website. Of course. I mean, just Harald Groskopf and bang, you have, I don't know, 50 pages <laughs> in the internet. It's no problem. But... Um, your uh, webpage haraldgroskopf.de yeah. Harald, I put it minus yeah. .de, yeah. yeah I will put the link into the description cool, of yeah. this YouTube video okay. and then what's the best way to get in touch with you uh, Facebook it's um, Facebook, Facebook okay. I'm I know, 10 times a day I'm looking into Facebook and there's this uh, this message thing you know and uh, if I have time I answer it spontaneously or or whenever I have time, I do it, you know. All right. So, Harold, I thank you very much for doing this. Life, thank you. <laughs> it was great, really. So many insights, you know, stories from the past, you know, how you develop your music career, how you recorded the albums. And also, I think um, it's very interesting to the viewers, you know, to learn mm. a bit about your insecurities, how you overcame them, and did great music anyway. I think this is a very, very valuable interview, really. I, I love it. Thank you. My uh, pleasure. Had... <laughs> so, um, Harold, then, thanks again. All right. If you enjoyed today's interview, then please give me a like and a subscribe. I have put the link to Harald's website into the description box of this video please check it out. And over here, I have put links to previous interviews and videos from my channel. Please check them out as well. So for today, I say goodbye. Have a good week. I see you next time. Until then, peace.